And so here we go. Welcome to Basic Rose Care, presented by Donna Malasso, president of the Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain. We are very happy and delighted that she is here tonight. Tonight, you'll learn about how to have beautiful roses in your garden, as well as about the library Rose Garden, which the Rose Society has helped design, plant, and maintain since, since 2002. Donna brings great knowledge and experience with roses to share with us. Questions that we're not, that Donna is not able to answer tonight uh, will be sent to the same email where you can, you can send to the same email that we are putting up to find out where the, to get the link for the recording. Um, Donna promises that she will, if she can't answer it herself, she'll send you some links as to where you can get the information you need. Uh, also, uh, oops. Now let's get started. Donna, take it away. Okay. Let me get my screen share going here. Okay, well, I'm so excited um, to present to you tonight about one of my favorite subjects, roses. I am so delighted to hear that we have a good number of uh, people signing up here for this program, and I, I hope that you will enjoy it. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my husband and I have been residents of Mission Viejo for 33 years. We are in our fourth house in Mission Viejo right now. I have been growing roses for over 20 years. Uh, I'm a longtime member of the Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain. Last year, I was able to complete the required course route, uh, excuse me, coursework through the American Rose Society to actually become a, a ARS consulting rosarian. Now, that doesn't mean I'm an expert by any means, but it means that I passed the coursework, I took an exam, and uh, I have just enough knowledge to be a little bit dangerous and I'm absolutely crazy about roses. Um, the bug to grow roses bit me when we moved into our uh, most recent home before this one. I didn't know a lot about them. Uh, there were some roses in the garden, but I did know enough to realize that they preferred sun and some of these roses were planted in the shade. And I thought, well, these roses are already in my garden. I might as well move them to a sunnier spot and see what happens. And uh, we left to go on about a two week vacation. And when I got back and see the, saw the blooms on this rose that I later found out um, was called a first prize rose, I was hooked. I bought about six bare roots that very year. And if you've ever uh, started a rose from bare root or even bought one say in January at Green Thumb or a local garden center and you see that something that basically starts out looking like a dead stick. And a few months later you have this gorgeous plant and uh, yeah, I've been involved in growing roses ever since. Now, before I get into my presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about the Mission Viejo Library Rose Garden. Now, whenever I get the chance, I ask people, well, have you visited the Rose Garden at the Mission Viejo Library? And my usual response is, I didn't know there was a Rose Garden at the Mission Viejo Library. And the next question always is, well, where is it? So I'm gonna show you right now where it is so you don't have an excuse and you can visit there often. This is, I think, a, a Google Earth shot above the library. And just for some perspective here, we got La Paz over here. You're gonna turn right on La Paz or whichever way you come from and go down Marguerite. You're gonna make your way up the Civic Center Drive just as though you were going to the library itself, which sadly you cannot go in the library right now, but hopefully very soon you can. You park in this area right here and let's pretend that you were going to the library. You would approach the front door and as you're facing the front door, you make a right-hand turn. You make your way down this little sidewalk right over here. You turn, you go back down the street just a little bit and right around here, you're going to see a sign at the bottom of a small sidewalk that announces you're at the Mission Vieja Library Rose Garden. And I've inserted a big giant secret rose right here to show you. 
Uh, once you know it's there, you can even look up a little bit when you're passing down the street here and you can actually see some of the roses growing from the street. Now, this is the sign that you'll see as you approach and you just walk up the little path that's a little bit hidden. And as you continue up the path, you're going to be greeted by this beautiful arbor that was gifted to our rose garden just last year. These pictures, some of them were taken uh, just last week. So we are not currently in bloom in the garden, but uh, last year we planted three beautiful red roses called Blaze Improved on here. And you can see they're already reaching up and over the top. And in uh, about five, six weeks, they're going to be covered with gorgeous red blooms. And so this is the, the view inside once you've entered the library, and it's just beautiful. I want to tell you a little bit about the background of this garden. So as Lulu said before, this garden was designed and planted in 2002 by members of the Saddleback, excuse me, the Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain and volunteers from our group under the great leadership of our current Rose Garden coordinator, Diane, uh, continue to prune, trim, and overall maintain the garden. The city of Mission Viejo also assists us with special projects, um, such as installing the arbor you just saw. If we have um, like a, a large established rose that we need removed, they'll send some of their, their uh, muscle help over there to help us do it and sometimes help plant. And every year, just after we prune, we have a big uh, delivery of about nine cubic yards of mulch delivered to the garden. And they also come and show up and aren't kind enough to spread that around for us. Now, originally in 2002, uh, this was intended and designed as a viewing garden only. In other words, you couldn't go inside and walk around. The idea was that you would go to the south side of the library, which is basically the genealogy section and the conference rooms down there, and it's all glass at the end. And you were just, you could look at the garden and enjoy it, but you couldn't actually enter in and smell the roses. But in 2012, there was a redesign. At that time, this beautiful fountain was installed. Uh, the benches along the south side were um, put in too. So we encourage you, you know, come on with your cup of coffee in the morning. It's beautiful. And uh, it's, from then on, it's been open to the public. So lucky us. Here's a few more views. This is looking at the south side of the library um, where before you could only view the garden. I believe this is a Princess Anne rose in the foreground here, a picture of some of these beautiful shrubs we have all along here. This is a, a shot of the garden in full bloom. And this also shows this Central Arbor. This was in the garden originally to the best of my recollection and actually found out when I was doing my background research here that this arbor was actually designed by the mother of one of our members, um, the members Don Saunders and her mother Marty actually designed this, this beautiful arbor. And another project the city did last year is they replaced the original structures we had to support some climbing roses here. This is Marguerite Parkway down here on the left for some perspective. Uh, when we originally planted the garden, it was not a big budget uh, endeavor. And we had put in some large wooden posts and a series of heavy chains between the posts. And we trained the climbers just up and around the posts and across the chains. Uh, but the, the new uh, trellises that they installed over here are a nice permanent solution and, and they look really beautiful. And here again is a shot looking back at the south corner of the library. Marguerite's here. And this is just a, a Betty Boop rose in full bloom. And here I'd like to give a little tribute to some of our dedicated volunteers. Uh, we have a really great time working together in the garden. These are all taken on our annual pruning clinic in January, which sadly is normally open to the public this year. We could not do that. But if you watch our website, we announce and every year in January, we do a pruning clinic. And if you'd like to learn more about rose care, you can show up and one of the experienced uh, rose gardeners in our group will actually give you a hands-on demonstration of pruning. So hopefully next year, we'll be back to doing that again. Okay, so this is definitely going to be an overview. Uh, we don't have time to go super in depth on any of these topics. Any of these topics could be their own separate talk. Uh, I just would like to recommend that since we'll be moving rather quickly, uh, if you know how to do a screenshot on your computer or if you have your phone handy, you may want to be ready to take some pictures of the screen for further reference. 
I am going to include a couple of slides at the end with helpful links that do a deeper dive on uh, most all of these topics. I also want to say that I, I think that the word Rose expert was used in my uh, bio. I'm not sure that that's uh, that may be a little overstated, but um, there's no single right way to take care of your rose garden. I am going to let you know based on my own experience in our climate what has worked for me. And I'm not going to tell you this is the only way by any means. Um, I'm just going to, you know, give you my best advice based on my um, my experience. So we're going to talk about why why should we grow roses? A little bit of overview on soil, feeding and fertilizing, pest control. Ugh, yes, but we have to do that. Deadheading, uh, keeping things tidy, and the rewards of growing roses. So first of all, why grow roses? Well, in my biased opinion, because they're absolutely gorgeous. I'm just going to show you some eye candy shots here of some really pretty ones in bloom. Here we have the library rose garden again, and this is a shrub rose called Pillowfight. This is the front garden of a good friend of mine who I met because I'm in the Rose Society. She actually was on our garden tour um, in 2019, and I drive by regularly to watch the progress of her Lady Banks rose. And this is a Lady of Shallot, which is a David Austin Rose in the, the Library Rose Garden again. And last year, the bloom was so pretty on this that I fell in love and I have an, a, another new uh, rose added to my collection. Another reason is you have a variety of sizes and types of roses that will suit almost any garden. If you have a small garden, there is a class called Minis, Miniature Roses. This is one I have called Baby Grand. Um, here's an average size shrub rose. Pro probably many of you grow this rose iceberg in your own garden. I think it's probably the most widely planted in our area just because it's so versatile. It's always full of gobs of blooms all summer long. Here's a, a, a shrub rose and here it's trained into a little uh, a rose standard tree. So it's even easier uh, to smell the roses at that height. And then there's uh, shrubs and climbers, which for someone with a large garden, it gives you lots of vertical interest. And this is not, this ballerina shrub is not even one of the larger climbers, but um, she sure is pretty. Also, our climate is one of the best in the world for growing roses. This is a picture of a secret rose in my garden in December. And as I participate in a lot of um, social media rose growing groups, I sometimes almost feel guilty that I have roses in December because if we were back east, we may have to actually deal with a lot of things uh, we don't have to even think about, like winterizing your roses. Uh, here in the cold climates, they may have to completely surround each bush with a cone and fill it up with dried leaves or compost. And you know, if I ever find myself complaining about all the work I have to do, I just have to think, you know what? We have it, it one of the best places in the world uh, to grow roses, so I'm not, I don't wanna complain. So let's talk a little bit about how to give your roses a good start and how to plant them. First of all, uh, roses really need a lot of sun. I'm gonna say a minimum of five hours. I sometimes see recommended four to six hours. I think four is on the low side. And although your rose may survive there, it may not be the most ro robust it can be. And it may also be a little bit more susceptible to some problems and disease. And always, always, it's a good idea to consider doing a soil test. I, mea culpa, have not actually personally ever done a soil test. I had always heard that your local county extension will do it for you at an inexpensive price. I was not able to locate that anywhere in our you know, greater Southern California area. I did find that Orange County uh, Farm Supply in Orange will do a soil test for you for $65. If you do the test, not only will they give you the results of the test, they will give you their recommendations as to precisely what you should do in order to improve your soil. And uh, you would have to contact them for the exact specifics of how to do that. For example, you know, how much do you send? You know, do you collect from multiple sites and so on? Now, if your soil is heavy clay, and again, I haven't had a soil test, but all the gardens in Mission Viejo that I've ever owned or most of the people I talk to, we tend to have very heavy clay here. And uh, what I'm gonna say is that adding plenty of compost is highly recommended. 
You may even want to remove some of the original garden soil to make room for the, uh, uh, the amendments that you're adding because once you fluff it up, you don't wanna kind of overflow your planters. And also a great um, addition to soil is lots of worm castings. They're very widely available now. Uh, this, during this season, they even have them at um, Costco, which is a very good price. It's a little bit small, small bag, which is easy for me to tote around the garden. Some of the ones you buy at the garden centers will be very large and heavy and, and rather hard to store. You want to make your hole two times wider than the root ball, but not deeper, because you don't want the rows to sink uh, down into the soil. And you want to make absolutely sure to backfill also with amended soil. If it, again, it's too heavy of clay, your soil will lack the proper amount of oxygen that it needs for the roses uh, to, to thrive. Water the hole before planting. Now, if you find that the water is taking over a day to drain, before it disappears, you may still need to do some more amending on the soil. I, I, you know, I know that seems like an extra step, but that extra step can be super important because if you don't give your roses a good start, they're just not going to do as well. And that problem is not going to be self-correcting no matter what you do after the fact. And also it's recommended to plant the root ball just a little bit above uh, the soil level. This is called planting proud. And uh, it means that if the, if the row sinks a little bit, it's still not going to be too deep. This is kind of showing you um, what a typical bare root rose looks like. Now, most of the roses that we buy, especially if you're not ordering online, are going to be a grafted rose. That means that the top of your rose from the bud union up is the rose you chose, such as Iceberg or Mr. Lincoln or whatever else. And from here below, is a different species altogether of rootstock. Um, typically around here, it's Dr. Huey, but you wanna make sure that you don't, that this part is not buried. Now that's, uh, that's advice specific to our climate in the East. You would wanna bury this again for cold protection, but for us, we want, we want it just a little bit above the soil level. Okay, so I'm just reiterating what I um, had on the slide. So, okay, that's a, a overview of planting. And then the last thing is, is to water it well. Now let's talk about water a little bit. Roses are not considered drought tolerant. And uh, that can be a little tricky here uh, with some of our watering restrictions, but um, although roses are not going to need as much water as something like a hydrangea, you need to make sure that they stay watered or they're not going to remain healthy. And depending on the temperature, and I know this is very generalized advice, but of course, we don't need to rain much this, excuse me, we don't need to water much this week, but in July and August, we really have to supplement. So the range of watering could uh, uh, be anywhere from two to five times a week, one inch each time. If you're unsure, I actually have used one of those really inexpensive water testers that kind of maybe cost about 10 bucks and you just kind of stick the prongs in the soil. And that way you can see whether you have an adequate amount of water. If you're using overhead watering, such as sprinklers or your hose, you want to make sure that that is done early in the day in order to give the bushes a chance to dry out. Um, wet leaves can contribute to some problems that we are going to talk about in a later section. And another great uh, suggestion, and not only for water conservation, but for many reasons, it's a really good idea to add a thick layer of organic compost. I um, many members in our Rose Society and also in the Rose Garden, as I mentioned before, we, go, we get Serrano Creek soil amendments and I'm including a link at the end of this presentation. If you're unfamiliar where that is, uh, Serrano Creek uh, is actually a horse ranch and the compost is made out of composted horse manure. It's fully composted. There is no odor whatsoever. And this is a great deal. It's very economical. You get a very large bag of this stuff uh, for $3.50, they'll load it in your car for you. And if you take the bag back, they actually give you a 50 uh, cent deposit return. And I've, I've found um, that it's, it's very nice looking in the garden and it eventually is going to break down and improve your soil. Okay, let's talk a little bit about feeding. I'm not a, a super proponent of organic feeding versus synthetic feeding. I think that they both have their place and I, I don't want to to make growing roses more complicated than it has to be because then you may not want to do it. 
So I'm going to include a little bit of information about each of those types. So if you want to go the super simple way, um, you may want to do um, something such as a miracle grow shaken feed or an Osmocote. You just want to get a balanced fertilizer. And the reason these are so convenient is that the uh, fertilizer is covered with a resin coating, which gradually breaks down as the um, as your bed is watered and uh, the weather happens and so on. And although I, I can't remember off the top of my head and you always, always need to read the instructions, I believe it only needs to be applied about once every three months. Other types of synthetics such as, you, you know, uh, miracle Grow rose food, these are so readily available, is also a synthetic. It takes a little bit more effort because this is a powder that you have to mix with water. So you're going to be doing a little bucket brigade. But if you want, you know, get more steps and you want a little bit of exercise, it's not a bad idea. And if you have a small garden, this is certainly another good option. And a magnum rose food is something that is specifically formulated for roses by someone who's kind of a biggie in rose circles. He's the, the former president of the American Rose Society. And as I was um, reading this label a little bit more carefully this week, because this is one of the ones I do use, there are actually some uh, faster acting and slower acting ingredients in this. So, so it's a good overall food for roses. You may have to order this online at, uh, or go to Orange County Farm Supply. It's not as readily available at a big box store. Now, another, some other advantages are of synthetics are that they are taken up by the plant more quickly and they will be uh, taken up by the plant even when the weather is on the colder side. Always follow the label instructions for application. You wanna make sure you water both before and after the application of any synthetic fertilizer, or you could, could get what's known as fertilizer burn, which is not good for the roots or the plants. And then a final comment on this, if you do choose to primarily use synthetic fertilizers, they are not going to improve your soil in any fashion. Um, in fact, over time, exclusive use of these alone can be actually a little bit detrimental to your soil. So if you are using them, you want to make sure that you add organic matter in some other means to the soil and your thick layer of organic compost would be a good way to counterbalance that use. Organic. Organic fertilizers are much more widely available now than they were when I first started growing roses. Um, they're derived from once living organisms. Now, as opposed to synthetics, they tend to be very low in nutrient content and, and not as effective during cool weather because their action is more biological. So as the weather warms up, these are going to become more active. However, the big benefit is that they are terrific for your soil. And here's a couple different types. Uh, some of these can tend to be a little bit smelly. Uh, fish fertilizer I do use, it has to be mixed in with water and, you know, applied using watering cans or buckets or something like that. You've got your alfalfa meal. The one that I use the most is called Grow Power Plus. This now is available at garden centers, probably not at Home Depot and Lowe's. Uh, I want to say this category would also include things like blood meal and bone meal, um, cotton seed meal, all of those things. And, uh, some of those I've tried to, but I found that blood meal and bone meal uh, may have been enjoyed by the roses, but also by my dog. And so when I apply these, I had a little bit of a problem in that respect. Uh, also alfalfa meal, I've had a bad, bad rabbit problems before. And although I'm assured that as long as you don't use the rabbit pellets, alfalfa meal is not going to attract rabbits, but I personally am just gonna stay away from that. There's plenty of other options for me. So my feeding pro program that I'm going to share with you, and I do I follow this religiously? No, this is an overview of what I use. And there are times when I'll hear someone talk and they'll say, oh, this fertilizer you add that to my issue and try a little bit. This is the one that most I, I stick to um, year to year. Once the uh, roses start to flush out with their new um, growth in the springtime is when I do my first feeding of the year and I use the magnum rose food that I showed uh, originally, which is a synthetic and also fish emulsion. So these are both water solubles and I mix them together so I don't have to do it twice and I give a nice feeding uh, after the first flush of growth. About a month later, I add the Grow Power Plus, which is an organic. That one's very easy application. It's a powder. 
what I've done is I have an old coffee cup. I put a cup of it in there and I put a piece of tape around inside of the coffee cup. And I find that that handle makes it super easy for me to apply. And I, I go according to the label instructions of how, how, what percentage of a cup or a whole cup do you apply based on the size of the rose. And for after that, I kind of alternate those two on approximately a monthly basis throughout the growing season. And I stop around September, end of September on feeding my roses. So that is my advice. And I'm gonna show you how it's worked in my own garden. Now we moved a year ago, January. When we moved into this house, um, this planter over here along the side, the far side of our driveway contained a very mature, as you can see, shrubbery, um, Pittosporum. There's a citrus tree here. Um, as my husband began removing this, he found another citrus tree buried underneath. So this was a very established uh, growth. We actually had to hire someone to dig this out. So we added about five full bags of amendments and those included some, um, oh, something I got like a, a farmer's blend. I believe I got from Dana Point Nursery and also peat moss. Uh, we followed the instructions for planting that I talked about. I threw a few hand, handfuls of uh, worm castings also into the holes. And so about six months later, I was actually amazed how well it did in that short of a time. This is what that same bed looked like. Now these are roses that had been started in pots in January. And so we're developing their root system during that time. And like I said, this, I would not look at this bed and think that it had only been in the ground about six months, but um, it's, it's a good you know, proof that treating the, the soil correctly and doing a good feeding really pays off. Okay, wah, wah. we don't have to talk about pest control. Um, I don't wanna make the too big of a deal of this, but I do wanna make you aware that if you grow roses, you're probably gonna have to deal with this and uh, I don't want it to deter you from uh, doing roses by any means, but uh, let's just talk a little bit about that. So first of all, keeping your garden tidy is going to do a long way towards preventing pests uh, being in your garden in the first place. As you're trimming your roses, you wanna to try to keep the center of the rose bush rather open. We call this sometimes a vase shape. The reason for that is when there's a lot of congested growth inside, it's not only going to trap moisture from watering, uh, it's going to be a more hospitable environment for pests of all types. And your roses need some air circulation in order to um, do what they can to naturally resist diseases. You wanna make sure that you're uh, on the lookout for yellowed or diseased leaves and keep them trimmed off the plant. And you want to keep your um, tools, especially your pruners, very clean. The disinfectant wipes, which we can get again now, we might not have been able to get them uh, the last, this time last year, but now they're, they're everywhere. A really good idea to wipe off your pruners in between each plant, especially if you know uh, that there's a disease on any of those plants. If you have to treat, if you can't tolerate uh, whatever is happening on your roses, you're gonna to wanna to become a little bit familiar with the, the labeling on some uh, pesticides and insecticides. My recommendation is that you only use products that have the, the signal word, this is called the signal word, caution, warning, danger, and so on. You don't wanna go above caution. That's gonna be the least toxic, the least um, impactful to the environment. And as I checked my own cabinet of what I used, all, all of my things either have no, late, no caution word or they have the, um, the word caution only. I don't have you know, the warning, et cetera. I don't have any of those. Yeah, avoid treatments with the signal words of warning and danger. They're there for a reason. I'm super paranoid on this, so I uh, am very hesitant to, to use anything stronger. I would also suggest that you avoid problems, uh, excuse me, products with the label three in one if you don't have all three of those problems. Uh, for example, if you've got an insect and no fungus, why you know, add a pesticide to your garden or something that could accumulate in your soil? Now, an exception to that would be possibly a two-in-one that includes a fertilizer as one of the things it contains. And it does have the targeted pesticide that you want. That might be an okay thing, but just try avoid over-treating. And always, always read and follow the label instructions to the letter. 
Now, before you treat, make sure you have identified the exact problem you have. One thing I would advise against, I would not go and do a general search on the internet for pet rose pests or something like that, because it may freak you out just a little bit because it's a big country, it's a big world, there are a lot of different climates. And in some places there are bugs that we will never see here, vice versa. And I don't want you to get uh, worried or intimidated. We do have a pretty limited range of things that we have to deal with in our climate. What you should do is take a clipping. You could bring it to a local nursery. Um, I can say that there's uh, helpful people at Green Thumb and also Plant Depot what you have and recommend a specific product for you. Our Rose Society or another local Rose Society will usually have a contact link. We would be happy to assist you if you contact us. Um, those of us who are consulting Rosarians, that's part of our charter is to help people identify and treat problems in the garden. Choose the uh, treatment that is least disruptive to the garden. And again, if you follow the, my advice on sticking with the caution label at the highest, you'd probably uh, be pretty well within that range. And also look for this symbol. Um, I found in my research that since 2013, any product that could be harmful to bees is required to have this uh, little warning symbol here on the right. And on the, um, the pictures I saw on the internet, this was usually on the front of the, um, the container. So very, very visible. Um, and if you really have to use that product, Make sure that you spray uh, either very early in the morning, and that would never be me because I'm not that early of a riser. Uh, I would wait until dusk when, the the, when you don't see any bees in your garden. This also would give time for the product to dissipate and dry a little bit overnight before the bees come back in the morning. Yeah, uh, and always, always, again, I can't say uh, too many times, read and follow the label instructions precisely. And I'm gonna just talk about three uh, three main pests we have that I think almost any garden is going to see. And first of all, I'm going to talk about aphids, partly because they're uh, the first ones that seem to appear in the spring. I don't know where aphids hang out the rest of the year, but somehow they know when the first buds of spring are starting to show up on your roses, and there they are. And uh, there's a lot of them, and it's very obvious what they look like, and they are going to try to suck the life right out of your buds, and you don't want them to stay there. They also, however, seem to be, uh, in, for me, the easiest things to treat. You can hose these off with a strong spray uh, from your hose, or if you're not too squeamish and you have a, a box of disposable gloves and you don't have maybe a huge rose garden, you can just kind of run your, your hand up the stem and over the bud and they are very soft and they're very easy to squash. If you wanna use a, a pesticide, uh, my research showed me, and I haven't tried this, but it's, it's considered safe for organic gardens. So at least it's not going to be harmful to your garden. This brand called Safer was labeled, uh, there was one that was labeled specifically for uh, use on aphids and you could try that. The one nice thing about aphids is that they tend to, at least in my garden, to appear at the beginning of the spring season. And I really never see them again until the following year. Powdery mildew is the next one that I'm gonna talk about. This is also quite easy to identify. You're going to see some white, either white spots on your leaves or as the disease uh, progresses, you're gonna get a white powdery coating even on your buds. This tends to show up during damp weather or what we call June gloom. That uh, provides the moist, humid conditions during which this uh, particular uh, affliction will occur. And the susceptibility of your roses also to powdery mildew can vary. Unfortunately, iceberg roses, as wonderful as they are, tend to be some of the less resistant to uh, this problem. I, I wouldn't say don't plant iceberg roses, but just be aware that you could have a problem um, and need to be watchful of that. Now, per, for any fungal disease, prevention and early treatment are going to be more effective than after you have a serious infestation. This is a product I found, again, labeled for organic gardens. Um, it's copper fungicide. Uh, if you treat with this when you, when you see that the weather report is predicting there to be uh, damp conditions in June gloom, and you may previously have seen this in your garden, 
you might try giving a pretreatment of this and you could do a lot, go a long way into preventing it from becoming a serious problem. But if you get disease, like especially this, um, the picture on the far right, if it's gone that far, you are probably gonna have to trim off that growth, which is always hard for us to trim off any, any buds that are on our roses, but you might have to do that, uh, try a treatment, and then hopefully the, um, the treatment will prevent this from recurring. And typically after the gloomy season is gone, again, this is rather self-correcting. It could be that some of your roses are not affected by it at all. You may see also that if you have some roses that are not in the sunniest of locations, there might be a little more problem with this. Okay, this is my least favorite one, chili thrips. Yes, it's not a typo, it is spelled with two L's. This has only shown up in Southern California in the last uh, several years. I think I've been dealing with it for about four years in my own garden, and sadly, it's come back every subsequent year. This is what the damage looks like. The chili thrips um, are going to, they're called rasping or sucking insects, and they basically just suck the life juice right out of your roses. Uh, if you're not sure if you have chili thrips, one way to identify them is to uh, take a piece of white paper, hold it up next to the affected area of the rose and kind of tap on the rose. If you have them, you're gonna see a series of teeny little sticks, very small, um, the di no more than diameter of a hair, but you will be able to see them on the white paper and that is basically diagnostic for chili thrips. These tend to thrive in hot weather. Um, apparently they're present most of the year, but their life cycle and reproduction cycle is so slow that we really don't see the damage. But as the weather heats up and yes, our summers have been getting warmer. So this problem has not become easier to deal with. That's when they're, you're gonna start seeing the damage. Again, the preventative treatment is highly recommended. Now that I know that this is a problem in my garden, when I see that the temperatures are going to go up, I actually start treating before I even see the problem. And if you get to a point where your, um, some of the growth looks like it appears in this picture, you're unfortunately going to have, that, have to cut that off and remove it because you're not going to quote unquote cure it from that area. Um, you're gonna have to give a little bit of a new start by getting rid of that, those bad portions. Now, a widely available product uh, contains an ingredient called spinosad. This ingredient is effective against chili thrips. Uh, spinosad is considered a relatively safe product to use. It's derived from bacteria. Uh, you again, though, would wanna spray either very early or very late because there can be some effect on bees, although their label says that it has minimal impact on pollinators, so that's good. I recently just uh, heard a new talk this past weekend by someone from the American Rose Society, and they're seeing some evidence that uh, worm castings on the soil or some uh, compost tea made out of worm castings sprayed onto the foliage can also be effective. This is new, new information for me, so I haven't tried it, but I am definitely going to give it a try. Okay, so we're done with pest control. I have links further down. Uh, we're here to assist you, but now let's talk about some of the, the easier things to deal with in the garden. So let's talk about deadheading roses. You wanna choose the proper uh, tools when you're deadheading or removing the spent blooms from your roses. You do not want to use an anvil pruner. That's what this type is. I really don't see these around so much at uh, Green Thumb as I used to. I think they're intended more for trimming back your shrubs and so on, but on roses, they will crush the stems. They won't give you a clean cut and that crushed stem can encourage disease. What you do wanna use is a sharp pair of bypass pruner and a bypass pruner is basically, is exactly what the name intends. They, they, the two blades cross over one another, just like a pair of scissors. You wanna keep them sharp, you wanna keep them clean. Uh, I don't uh, you know, have a particular recommendation. There's good ones by, by Corona. My personal preference is Felco. These are a bit of an investment, but I find I have a quite small hand and I was able to find a Felco model number six that fits very well into my small hand. And I just ergonomically, it just, it just feels better in my hand than a larger um, version of some other brand. And I also recommend you have a good thick pair of long gloves. This would be particularly important when you're doing your annual pruning. 
Um, you don't want to get those puncture wounds from the thorns of your roses because they can be nasty. Believe me, I can't tell me you how many times I've gotten this. And you, you don't want to end up like you've been in a fight with your cat. So get a good, good pair of gloves. And I've had these a long, long time. Okay, and you want to cut at least low enough so that the stem you're leaving behind is approximately the diameter of a pencil. The main reason for this is you want it to be strong enough to support the growth, your new growth and the new roses. You don't want them to flop over when they come out. So you may have to go down a little ways depending on the size of your plant, but you know, ways down. You wanna cut a fourth of an inch above an outward facing bud eye. And I know this, some of this talk sounds a little bit familiar, but really it's not, uh, it's not brain surgery or anything like that but I am gonna show you if you see this terminology so you'll know what to look for in that event. Often this bud eye can be close to a, a set of leaves. And I, I kind of have the, uh, okay, I'm making it so I can see it here. Yeah, see, this, this one is very, very much easier to see because it's right by this set of, uh, of five leaflets here. And uh, that's, a, that's the place that you wanna look for to plant. And you wanna try to trim near one that's facing the outside of the plant. Again, you're avoiding getting that congested growth toward the inside of the plant. Oh no, and my... Okay, I am having a technical difficulty because my slide will not advance. Let me try exiting here. Okay, uh, Sandy or Lulu, can you advise me here? I, I just... I am having a problem we had the other day. Maybe I'm gonna do a stop share for a moment and try to get back in here and see if, if they'll advance properly. Is that okay? That sounds good. Yeah. That's, that's good. Okay, I'll just do that for a second. Okay, I hope this I hope this works. Are you guys seeing me again now? Yes, we are. Okay, good. All right. So where were we? We were talking about the distance above the new growth that you want to cut about a fourth of an inch. It's also a 45 degree angle is also recommended. And I don't want you to, you know, um, go to uh, be so careful about this that it's gonna, you know, make you think you're doing something wrong. Uh, the angle is recommended just so that the water can run off and not stay and collect on the end of the rose. But in my opinion, the distance from the bud eye is more important than the angle. However, uh, this is a, a series of pictures that shows the right, a couple of wrong ways and the right way. In this case, they've cut too high above the new growth. In this case, the angle is much too steep and you've you probably kind of cut off some of the inside of this new portion of the rose that's growing. And this, this would be um, the just right version, okay? Let's see, that did not do it. Somehow I added a new rose, okay. So the reason we wanna remove the dead blooms or the spent blooms is because any blooming plant is programmed or designed to reproduce itself. And once you have left the spent blooms on the plant and you're getting rose hips, the plant kind of thinks it's done its job for the year and it may not want to uh, continue to bloom. And so we certainly don't want that to happen. So the dead henning is going to promote a faster rebloom. And here's just a couple more uh, photographs of someone showing the, the location here. It's a little bit hard to see, but again, we're going for this area, a fourth of an inch above the set of five leaflets here. And this one is showing how to deadhead on uh, you may have a shrub rose or another type of rose that has a multiple bloom on one head. And you also want to snip out that central, uh, that central bloom, the one that comes out first. You want to take that off. And once you do that, more of the energy of the plant will be subsequently directed to the new buds that have not yet bloomed. And when you're deadheading again, clean up the excess growth in the center of the rose. Um, this was a picture I took last week. It's not super clear but I'm showing you generally the shape I am trying to maintain on this plant. I've got my canes pointing toward the outside of the bush. And, and if I see, and, and they will continue to try to grow this way across the middle. 
I continue to keep that trimmed out as time goes on to just avoid that congestion and so on inside the middle of the plant. I call that the muddle in the middle. So let's avoid the muddle in the middle, keep the growth on the outside, keep some really nice air circulation going inside that rose. And one other thing is that if you want a single long stem, like if you like the big vase of the single stem roses, I'm gonna show you something called disbudding. Now, typically a hybrid tea rose, that would be maybe a Mr. Lincoln, Queen Elizabeth, those are some very common ones. They, they are supposed to uh, send up the blooms as a single stem. And my observation has been usually the first bloom of spring, they will do that. But later on, I found that they will start to send up these, these little side buds here. And if I'm really wanting a single healthy bud, what I can do is as, as I'm walking around my garden, I don't even need a tool for this. You just kind of snip or you know, bend these or pull them off. And then you will have all that energy going to the single bloom and that single bloom will tend to be a little bit more, more beautiful and robust. And again, continue to remove any discolored or diseased uh, leaves as, com as a common practice. <clears throat> now let's talk about the rewards. Why would you go through all of this? And really, I, I don't wanna say it's that much trouble. It's way easier for us than in many climates, <clears throat> but I think it's worth the effort and let's talk a little bit about why. These, these pictures were all taken by me. I'm not a professional photographer. These are taken with my phone. You saw that I don't have a super complicated feeding program, although I do feed, it reg, feed them regularly. And this is what some of your blooms can look like. I've got two pink roses here on the left. These were in our previous garden where I had about 50 roses. This is a climber called Dreamweaver. <clears throat> excuse me, this Eden climber is a super popular variety. Um, I can't get enough of it. I already have planted two in my new garden, which is one more than I had in my old garden. But this, um, this creates just a beautiful spot. People can sit under here and you know have pictures taken. Uh, some more roses from my previous garden, a yellow here named Helmut Schmidt. I have fame over here. And you're, the more you tend to your roses, the more you baby them, the more beautiful blooms they are going to reward you with. <clears throat> Donna Darlin, you can guess why I have this in my garden. I actually brought it from our own garden. You can no longer purchase this one commercially, commercially unfortunately, but I just love it. it. It reminds me a little bit of Double Delight, which is a very popular rose. This is the uh, garden of one of our members, Emmy. Uh, again, Eden climbing roses, even these are more huge than the ones I had in my garden growing up against the side of her house. And this is a much smaller rose down here, Bonica. It's a smallish uh, shrub rose or it can be kept smallish, but even these small blooms are just so beautiful and each one has its own personality. Um, I, I love to go out walking in my garden in the early morning or you know, the early evening and those golden hours where you may have a little bit of dew on the roses. Um, every bloom is unique, even on the same plant. Every series of blooms is different one from the other. I never get tired of watching that progression of blooms from, again, what look like bare, you know, dead sticks in January and watching the new leaves come out. And then that first spring bloom is gonna be your best and most beautiful bloom of the year. Don't expect that all the subsequent blooms are gonna look the same. It's gonna get hotter. Your roses are gonna struggle in the heat just like we all do, but still it's, uh, I think it's really worth it. And I love giving bouquets to people. It's one of my favorite things. People appreciate this so much. Um, people who grow roses appreciate it because they understand the effort and time that's involved. And people who don't grow roses say, oh, I just don't have a green thumb. This is so nice. Now, this I cannot take credit for. This arrangement was made by one of our members, Deanna, from Blooms out of her own garden. Uh, this is from Blooms in my own garden, one of my favorite roses named Moonstone. All of these blooms came from one bush at one time. Uh, it's such a prolific bloomer and I just uh, interplant with a little bit of Alstrom Maria and it makes a gorgeous uh, bouquet to have in my own home or to give away as a gift. There's some more uh, with some roses from my own garden. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I know it went fast and a little bit uh, on the surface here. But I'd like to thank you for joining me on behalf of my Rose Society, the Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain. 
uh, through whom and from whom I've learned virtually everything I know about growing roses and made some wonderful friends. Please visit our website. We are at rosesrosesroses.org. We are also on Facebook um, under, again, Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain. I try to post regularly there. Uh, we share pictures of our gardens there along with other members and people who've friended our group who aren't even in this area or in our group. Um, I was gonna say that uh, we, I post information about upcoming gardening events I know about. I post our events on it. Our group is meeting virtually right now as is everyone. But if you watch our website, you can see our upcoming programs. And if you uh, are interested in getting the links, you can either uh, send a Facebook message to me. I'm the admin at that page and uh, ask for the link and I'd be happy to send it to you. And uh, I would love to have you join us. So if you have your camera handy, I'm gonna now, I'm gonna show the, the slides with the links for further information on each of these. Minutes. So I've got planting, watering, feeding. Uh, some of these are YouTube present presentations, which there is a ton of information. Uh, these links that I'm including are either climate specific to our climate or I know and I reviewed them all and I found that these were good representations, but um, sometimes not helpful to search uh, and, and get results from someone who's growing roses in Pennsylvania because their advice is going to be very different from ours. And here is the other page of references. And so um, with that, I think we can address whatever questions. And if I can't answer your question just off the top of my head, um, the ladies at the library have been kind enough to offer to convey your questions to me. And I will be happy to get back to you on that. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Please, uh, if you do have any questions, please type them in the chat and we'll pass them to Donna uh, for her to answer this evening. Okay, it looks like we've got someone asking a general question about mini roses in containers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> any was thoughts on that? Was there a specific question? No. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, minis can be grown in containers. I wouldn't advise too small of a container. Um, you're going to have to be more careful about diligently watering any rows in a container. And the information I gave about treating the soil with organic compost and stuff is not going to apply. Uh, you don't, you have basically probably plant in an artificial potting medium of some type. Um, there is a good blend that you can get at Dana, at uh, Plant Depot and also at Laguna Hills Nursery uh, called Top Pot. Uh, that's a good uh, type of potting mix to use. Uh, the rose is going to be completely dependent on you adding probably synthetic fertilizers uh, exclusively because the nutrients are going to quickly leach out of the pots. So hopefully that, uh, if that doesn't answer your question, uh, you could elaborate and you know, send a little bit more specific information here on the chat. Or um, again, as Lulu mentioned, you could send it to the same link through which you, um, you joined this presentation. Okay, we've got another question. Do you have any suggestions for companion plants in the garden? I do. I'm sure there's many more than what I use. Um, one of the bouquets I showed you a couple of slides back was Alstroemeria. It, I believe it's also called Peruvian lily. Those um, are wonderful. Uh, they produce a lot of blooms, very long lasting, also in uh, a bouquet. They, you know, will, they start blooming. In fact, mine outside are blooming now and they will bloom probably through midsummer when the strong summer heat hits them, they start to fade a little bit colors available. They are a little uh, slow to start in the soil, but once they take off, you can actually easily divide and transplant them around. So you have them in several areas. I like salvia. Um, there is a salvia called Mystic Spires. 
that I, I have uh, planted relatively recently in my garden. And boy, that thing is beautiful. It's still blooming now. It's a great pollinator attractor. My hummingbirds love it. Uh, there is another variety I got at Green Thumb called Victoria Blue. Those also did quite well, um, the, you know, just the first year. And these tend to be um, perennial. They may be, you know, not last forever, but they will overwinter in most cases. I have also used um, true geraniums. This is not the, the, what the, the, most of the thing we think of as geraniums are pelargoniums. This would be, you'd look for a true geranium, which is more of a vining plant. And this will spread and kind of uh, help cover up the ground a little bit even. It will die way back in winter, but you can give it a hard prune and it will uh, come back. I'm trying to think, I have used alyssum. Uh, that's not something really that's a cut flower, but it reseeds very freely. And if you have a lot of open space uh, underneath the roses that you kind of want a no fuss, no muss, it'll self seed and continue to come back year after year in the form of new plants. I like Dusty Miller. Uh, I like the, the contrast of the gray foliage of Dusty Miller as contrasted with the foliage of the roses. And it also is a nice um, foliage to tuck in uh, to bouquets. Trying to think, lavender would also be another good choice. Spiky blooms attract bees. Uh, those are some of the things. I'm sure there's many more, and I'm sure there's lots of information you could find online on that subject. Okay, our next question, I think I'm going to redirect. It's about um, a place to buy natural stone. She's commenting about the fountain at the library. Um, so Clarissa, if you could email your question to the library programs at cityofmissionviejo.com email. I think I need to pass this on to my facility maintenance people, um, but I think we'll be able to get you an answer. It might take a couple days with the way everybody's working um, right now, but I will certainly try. Um, unless Donna, you happen to know some fantastic natural stone places. Would this be like for large stones or pebbles or? Um, so she's looking for a place to buy natural stones. She wants to like do three stones piled on top of each other. So I'm guessing kind of on the fairly okay, I do. Side. I do know a couple of places. Um, okay, you great. Wanna go, you wanna go to some place like a Sepulveda Building Supply or um, Thompson Building Materials that might be called in orange also resource building material, which is tucked. Uh, if you know where Ganal Lumber is, it's the next street down from that. There's, there's kind of a little loop that goes through there of more industrial type of businesses. They will have large stones and rocks of different colors and shapes. And you basically pay for them by the pound. Um, that would be one source. I was gonna say, I, I didn't mention earlier, but if you're interested in, in learning more about that fountain, there is a nice plaque in the garden itself that uh, gives a little bit of that background and gives the credit to the, uh, the artists who designed that. And I believe it was installed by, or helped installation by some volunteers on, um, oh, was it uh, the, when, the Art, Arts Alive program? Yeah, one of the Arts Alive programs that the mission, uh, that the city holds. So those okay. would be a couple of places I know. I mean, we, we've shopped there for stepping stones and such like, and yeah, they do have the, the larger landscape rocks. Okay, that's great. Okay, someone uh, appreciated you mentioning the Dr. Huey on the lower part of the bush. They think they have a bush where that has taken over the rose bush. Okay. They're going to remove the plant. Will a new bush be affected when they plant it? You mean in, in the old spot? Is that the yeah. implication? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, this is a subject that I didn't cover, but I will say a couple words about this. If you're replanting a rose in the same spot that an old rose was in, you can do that, but it's strongly advised to remove as much of the root material from the old rose as you possibly can. The reason being, and, and this is kind of makes sense if you think about it, uh, once a plant dies, the microorganisms in the soil are there naturally to break down that remaining plant material. And if you, the thinking is that if you plant a new rose in that spot, and those, uh, those organisms may also affect the new rows, the new roots that you are putting in as they're getting established and your rows may not thrive as well. So um, 
yeah, remove as many of the old root material, as much of the old root material that the old rows left behind as possible. And if you want to look that up, it's commonly referred to as rose replant disease. You could find more information on that. Okay, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, if you have a rose without a name, how can it be identified? Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons that our Rose Society is there. Uh, between all of us, we've grown hundreds, maybe thousands of different types of roses. Um, if you want to send, a, you know, con do a contact link again through our Facebook page or our website and contact us, we'd be happy to pass a picture around if you, you may, may not have one this time of year because the roses are not blooming. Um, I also see people posting pictures of roses on Facebook uh, gardening sites. I Mm, yeah, sometimes you get a whole lot of opinions there and it may be better to ask someone in the local area because it, it's more likely that we've grown it. Now, I would say too, if you have a, a rose you've bought from Trader Joe's or someplace like that, it is likely not to be something that an official named variety. So yeah, when it's blooming in spring, take some pictures of the blooms and of the overall plant itself because the size and shape of the plant can also help with that identification. And yes, we would love to help you figure it out. I can't guarantee that we can figure it out, but we'd sure love to help you to try. Oh, and something else I forgot to mention. Uh, go to the rose garden at the library when it's in bloom. The roses are all labeled. So if you are shopping for new roses, look like in our climate, um, of course, you know, we treat them pretty well. We give them all the mulch and stuff like that. We don't do a super lot of uh, supplemental feeding in the garden but that's a great way to learn some rose names and you, you may just come, uh, come out of there with a little shopping list for yourself. Okay, we've got another question. Um, any suggestions on how to get rid of baby tears that grow around roses? Or hmm. roses? I, I think that baby tears would look pretty around roses myself. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised they're doing that well, being that it's probably a sunny area. Uh, yeah, I would not recommend the use of an herbicide. I definitely would strongly recommend against using anything like Roundup near your roses. Um, it's, not, it's, it, it's not good for them. Uh, you know, there's varying opinions of how long it stays in the soil even, I, I mean, I. I I would say that I have used it like along the strip of my driveway, but I, I keep it away from my roses. I, I had some baby tears at my other garden and it seemed to me that if I, I just, it, it seemed rather easy to, to dig away. And you might wanna just kind of take the side of your trowel and just kind of pull it along there. And I know that that's not going to eradicate it. It's probably going to be coming back. But uh, I, I think it, I'd feel kind of lucky if I had something uh, pretty growing like that under my, I know that may, you may be sick of them and really hate that stuff. But other than that, I don't, you know, you may try to smother it also with a thick layer of compost. That's, that would be my suggestions. I, I hope that's helpful. Okay, and then someone is asking, um, they've heard that the aphids attract ants. Is that true? You know, I've, I think I've heard that uh, with respect to citrus. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head the relationship there. One of them may give off something sticky. I, I haven't really seen the aphids attract ants onto my roses. Uh, I also haven't had a, a super bad ant problem in my garden. So I, um, I could try to find more information about that. If you're interested, yes, send the link uh, like explained before and I can try to look that up, but I, I don't, can't answer that right off the top of my head. Okay, and then referring back to our um, stone, question. Um, do you happen to know if there's a stone mason that can make them oval shaped? That, that I, can't, I can't help with that. That's okay. out my, outside my wheelhouse. But you could probably ask at the place you're purchasing the stones. I would, I would think imagine that's a good they idea. would have that as a resource. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions from anyone? Sandy, there's yes. one in the Q and A's that got put in there. Oh. Okay, let me pull that okay, up. Okay, we'll take quick. a look there. Okay, um, someone would like to know, Donna, if you have a favorite 
small climbing rows. Small climbing rows. So as I said before, and as obviously it's one of my favorites, and it's not one of the huge climbers, Eden, the pink Eden rose is a favorite of mine. Um, it's a different subject entirely, but if you want to grow climbing roses, uh, this is, it's actually recommended that you don't grow them straight up the, the, whatever support you have. For example, if you have an arbor, you don't want it to just go straight up and over because the growth comes out of the side shoots, not the main canes. So you want to kind of weave that growth back and forth um, as it approaches the top. So effectively your rows may be as long, but it's not going to overpower the structure that you're putting on if you grow it in that manner. Um, and anyway, Eden, even in my garden, even, uh, even growing straight up before I knew that information, I don't think it got more than about 10 feet tall. And I would consider that on the smaller side. Um, let's see, Dreamweaver, I also had in my previous garden, did it not get overly large? That's a deeper, a deep pink rose, Dreamweaver. And those would be two that I could tell you off the top of my head. Um, if you if you want further information or if that if you have a different color that you specifically want, um, and again, come to the rose garden. The um, the trellis along the I guess this would be the east side of the garden is full of climbing roses. And I will tell you that in in that garden, I think because we've been adding this Serrano Creek compost over the years. Uh, some of these plants that I'd never got anywhere near this that big in my garden are giant over there. Uh, like Betty Boop, for example, and Marilyn Monroe, they're giant. But you can keep the, the growth trained to a smaller size. It's not that hard. And I'm thinking that in this garden, we have at least, at least 10 different climbers to choose from. And again, they have labels on them. So it's a perfect place to go shopping. So I would suggest you go over there. And if you want me to send you more information, I'd be happy uh, to look up some links to forward to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that looks like that's questions um, on our end. Shall I, um, I would like to thank Donna so much for her time uh, and everything because uh, it, that was just fantastic information, whether you already are into roses or if you're just starting out, um, there was a lot of information there. And actually, I just, I put this up twice and now it looks like it's been up three times. Um, if you have any questions that were not addressed tonight or that uh, you would like Donna to answer, she will be happy to do that if you will uh, just send it to the library programs at cityofmissionvo.org. I have it listed in the chat. Um, also, you use that email to find out where the link for the recorded version of this presentation is and to get uh, the links to suppliers mentioned. We will have those links and we'd be happy to send them to you if you didn't take a picture or if it's easier just to have a link sent to you. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Donna again. Uh, this is a wonderful presentation. And I, I know I learned a lot and I hope everyone enjoyed it and learned and also learned too. So uh, until, have a happy planting season and some <laughs> pretty roses. And thank you. And Donna, we'll go out there and check out that rose garden. Okay, uh, come, come visit in about five, six weeks. It's going to be beautiful. And thank you so much for the opportunity, Lulu. I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate all your time and effort to do this because I know it takes a long time to get everything together and so appreciative of your knowledge. My okay, pleasure. everybody, that's it for now. Any questions, just get a hold of us at the library programs at cityofmissionviejo.org. That's it for tonight. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.